returning very swiftly to the subject at hand. The position that we are really discussing here is a structuralist position. When we look at that base superstructure model, what we are arguing is that society itself has a particular structure. And that structure is dependent upon the ownership of and the ideological positions of a particular class in society. This is called structuralism. So a structuralist critique looks at how society itself is structured. Who is the elite of society? Why are they in an elite position? And therefore, what effect does that have on the rest of society? How does that hierarchical position structure society itself? <coughs> now, we're always undergoing subtle shifts in structure in societies. Society never remains completely static over time. Over the last 20 years, we have seen a shift in the structuralism of contemporary societies. A shift away from traditional models of ownership, which is, you know, some people who own factories that make stuff, or um, print works that print out newspapers, towards a structuralism which instead rewards um, an elite in society who are elite because of what they know. You might think this is a good thing. You know, knowing the stuff is a much more equitable situation than just having a factory or something like that. But it's not quite the utopia that we might want it to be. Now, our you know, major influences in society, not just in terms of what they own but what ideologies put out, are people like Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk. Elon Musk is <coughs> like an idiot. Okay? An absolutely stone cold fucking idiot. If I saw Elon Musk in the street, I would kick the crap out of him. Because he is a fucking idiot. And he needs it. Somebody needs to literally give that look a high bit. Because he is dull as a twat. Now, how is he at the elite end of society because of things that he knows? This is what we call an epistocracy. Not an aristocracy, but an epistocracy. And the stuff that these people know is a particular form of technological skills based around programming, coding, etc. Bezos the same. Zuckerberg certainly the same. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen Zuckerberg when he has to go in front of the US Congress to talk about what bad things his company's doing. Zuckerberg is an alien. He's not even a human being. He, he, I mean, I, don't, I think I can say this as somebody who's neurodivergent and he's on the autistic spectrum and has ADHD, but that guy has got like so much autism, it's not funny. I mean, he, he, he needs help, okay? Um, and these people, <laughs> And their ideological positions are just as worrying as people in the past. Okay, so structurally, society is organized, and capitalist societies in particular, in this way. Now, the reason why I use the image of monopoly behind this, I wonder, does anyone know why? Why have I put monopoly here? Flynn? Well, originally, and, and today, I would argue as well, monopoly as a game, what do you have? Okay. I, um, it's a little bit difficult for me to answer this question, so I'm going to put it out to you, because I've never actually played a game of Monopoly that's finished. Because at some point, I get a shit fit, because I'm losing, and throw the board across the table, right? Usually after about 20 minutes. Is there anyone who's ever finished a game of Monopoly in this room? <laughs> okay. Good. How'd you win? Well, I have bankruptcy. You, you make everyone else bankrupt. <coughs> yeah, so there's one person left. Legitimization of the structure of society. What we're going to say is that you know the winner, the, the person who wins, the person who's the best, is the person who owns everything at the end of the day. It's a discourse in monopoly that the way that you win is by owning everything. My discourse of it is, I don't want to play your game, and I'm going to throw it all over. <laughs> There's many lessons in this uh, little uh, 
uh, sort of outlet we have just given, uh, one of which is don't ever play a game with me because if you beat me, I'll <coughs> act like Tom. But two, things like Monopoly, a game, has encoded in it the ideas of the structure of society. The structuralist position argues that games like Monopoly have the structure of society encoded into them. The way that you win the game is by accumulating the most capital possible and bankrupting all of your enemies, making them poor and dependent upon you. That is how society is seen to work. You think, okay, well, does that work for other things? Well, sure it works for other things. It works for a whole bunch of other things, in fact. Does anyone in this room watch Made in Chelsea? Shame on you. Shame on you. 200 fucking channels, and that is the junk that you watch. I have never, ever in my life wanted to own an Uzi more than when I watch Made in Chelsea. Because if I owned an Uzi or any kind of submachine gun, I could find those people and make them eat lead. That would give me joy. It would make me feel warm. And then I'd go after Tally. But, aside from my homicidal impulses, what Made in Chelsea as a program tells us is that in order to be <coughs> successful, in order to be good, in order to have all the nice things in life, you need to be rich as shit. And in order to be rich as shit, you need to have a rich family. <laughs> so actually, you plebs, it ain't for you. If you're watching Made in Chelsea, you ain't. People who would be on the Made in Chelsea ain't watching Made in Chelsea. Made in Chelsea, I can assure you. Okay? So, there are image, you know, these constant bombardment of images, and then, you know, if you want another example of it, look at influencer culture on Instagram, for example. You're constantly bombarded with imagery of this stuff, this stuff, in order to be happy, you need to buy this shit, and this shit, and this shit, and go to these places. You need to be in Dubai, like, every other week, because that's where it's all happening. So, like, That is the structure of how things are. Okay. So, all games like Monopoly, influencer culture, made in fucking Chelsea, all embody particular ideologies. An ideology is a dominant form of social consciousness. For Marx, ideology was about the ideas of a ruling class. You can have ideologies which compete with those, but they are doomed to fail because the ideologies of a ruling class will, for Marx, always be dominant. We see it in so many ways. This image here, again I'm going to the United States for this. The suburban home with the white picket fence. The embodiment image of what is called the American dream. And politicians of all kinds always want to talk about the American dream in America. We're going to reignite the American dream. Does anyone know what the American dream is? Yeah. But how do you get that stuff in the first place? Well, you move to you can you can be an American, or you can move there, you can migrate there. Yeah, but you still, you've got then you've got to do something. The key word was that one. Word. If you work hard, the American dream basically says this. If you work hard, you can have all of that. That's, that's it, basically. The American dream, in a nutshell, is America is an equitable society. If you put the work in, and you're not lazy, you're not a bum, that's going to be your reward. That box. Total and utter box, and always has been. But it's a very important ideological tool in American society. It keeps people in America voting for idiots like Barack Obama. Now, compared to the one who came after him, Barack Obama was a genius. But he actually wasn't that great president. He didn't do much to solve inequality in America. He, he 
extended drone warfare to a horrific extent, etc., etc. The American economy was pretty moribund when he finished with it because his ideas on the economy weren't great. I mean, I, I like a lot of things about Obama, but I also see that there's a lot of problems with them as well. But Obama was all about the American dream, because they all are. All American, no American president's going to come out and say the American dream. That's bollocks, that is. We're not going to bother with that. If they were honest for one second, they would say, does it really matter how hard you work? Actually, what's much more important is how rich your parents are. In American society, that's far more important to how happy your life is going to be. How rich your parents are. <coughs> that's really the, only, the only reliable indicator of who goes to the top universities in America, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, etc., is wealth or family. It doesn't matter how hard you work. You'd be some kid in some high school in Detroit, work your ass off, get the best grades that you can get, you ain't going there. You ain't got the money to go there. You will never get through that ceiling. Our society is not that different. Again, the best predictor of GCSE results, A-level results, is not amount of work put in or attendance or anything like that. The best and most reliable correlation with top scores in those tests which you all have to do in order to get on in life <coughs> is wealth. Always. Sorry. So I know this is horrible. <laughs> if, if, it's any, if it's any consolation to you, I grew up really poor, so you know, I've had to deal with all this shit as well. But it's not much of a consolation. I, know, I should do a trigger warning before this lecture, really, shouldn't I? Sorry about that. Ideologies, ideas which help to legitimize the dominant political power. Now, the idea of the American dream legitimizes the structure of American society. <coughs> when you're given the idea of the American dream, that what, I can have all this great stuff if I work really hard, you stop complaining about, who are these rich clowns in Washington telling me what to do? You know? Why is so much money being given to the military every year? Why is it that you know African Americans are 50 times more likely to die in police custody than white Americans? Stop asking those questions because your focus is actually on work hard and then I can have a nice house with a picket fence and the 2.4 children <coughs> and you know and you know, I can go to Florida once a week uh, once a year or some shit. 2.4 children? That's the average number of children. Well, I guess some people have three and some people have two. I was just speaking in Africans. But it's interesting that I did speak in Africans because do you know that 88.2% of statistics are made up on spot? <laughs> Never fucking listen to statistics, all right? Unless you've researched it yourself, don't take it as well, okay? If I, if, again, I'm just coming up with knowledge and lessons here. It's amazing. I'm so proud of myself. So. We see this ideology used time and time again. The reason why I display this is uh, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, and Monday, two so different people <coughs> using exactly the same phrase over and over again. Because Trump and Obama, yeah, they are different, and you know, Trump is a demon sent up from the bowels of hell to make life the worst for us all. But, at the end of the day, Trump is part of an elite, part of American society, like Barack Obama. The ideological positions that he uses legitimizes the position of elites, just as the positions of Obama did as well. Which is kind of depressing, because it doesn't matter, basically what you have in the American society is like a puppeteer in the middle of you have like Republicans over here and say, look, I'm talking about this stuff, and then you have the Democrats over here, no, 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 and you can only see the puppets, but actually there's only one thing. Underneath. Controversially, I would also say that's the same for Labour and Conservative as well. <coughs> when we talk about legitimacy of ideologies in society, the worst, single worst, most evil corporation in history <coughs> is that one. Because ideologically, what function does Disney serve in our society? 
Ask yourselves that question, my friends. What message does Disney consistently give? Now let me change the word women to girls. What I'm referring to is <coughs> females before they become them, when they are young, when they are children. What message does Disney consistently give? Where is that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, starters, just from like, the whole Disney princess you know, like the, the, the company, it gives off this ideology that you need to have a man to save you, which is said in basically any single film. And Number one, <laughs> the route to happiness when, from when you become from when you're a girl to when you become a woman is to have a man. Keep going. Um, I'm liking this. Uh, well, um, you ask you, okay, let me ask you a question. What kind of man? Rich. A rich man. <laughs> Number two, my friend. The man is not some fucking schlub like me. It is a rich man. Man with money. Because you can't be happy, one, unless you're in a heteronormative, heterosexual relationship, and two, that heteronormative, heterosexual relationship must be with a man who has money. Let's keep going. Um, beauty standards. Beauty standards. You do not look like a schlubby bitch. You must wash your fucking hair every day. You must always be made up. You must always be wearing some kind of dress that has a, you know, picking up dirt and shit. All right? Let's keep going. <laughs> Have we got anything we can add here? Absolutely. The only way you can get out of shit in life, if something goes wrong, you get the man to fix it for you. Oh yeah, you have no agency. Women who have agency are unhappy and will bound to fuck it up. And then you need to get a man to come and fix it. Let's keep going, my friends, because there's more to be said. Anything else about this evil, evil organisation? Absolutely. Fairy tale princesses either have rich parents or, by proxy, live in a position in which they can access the rich. Yeah. So, those of you who are locked out of wealth, eh, boo hoo hoo. They're all like trapped in some way, whether it's in like a tower or whether it's like a parental control. Women are constantly <coughs> trapped. The role of women in society is not to create your own way, but is instead to be led by men into how life will be. Because if you don't have a man, you will be trapped as a woman. Yeah. No, no, that's in absolutely every single Disney film. It's at some point they're doing some sort of house job. Indeed. <laughs> the primary role of labour for women in society is not working in a job which gives them satisfaction, but is instead performing menial domestic tasks in order to please men. Have we got anything more? Ariel, obviously, she's like silent for a lot of it, her voice gets taken away and after yes. her. Women do not have their own voice. Women are either silent or the stuff they come out with is so inane and bullshitty that you wouldn't listen to it anyway. Women's voice is unimportant. Men have all the important lines. Let's keep it going, people. We are doing a bitching ideological review here. That's what you're going to say. All right. For the, for the needs of time, you're going to have to move on. But this is ideology. Now, <coughs> who is the audience for this shit? Young girls. Young girls. Are you frightened? The company most responsible in the 20th and 21st century for the maintenance of a patriarchal ideology in Western societies is that law. <laughs> because from an extremely young age, females are asked to internalize a model of what success in the world is, which involves giving up their agency, giving up their voice, giving up their wishes and desires to have a career, and instead 
committing themselves to a singular purpose, which is finding a man who is dominant. Could you argue also, like, a lot of them are quite lonely and have, they all have, like, animal facts because they're on the road, so they don't have a man. What is the lesson in that, Alicia? Yes, you do, because you kind of said it already. You do know what the lesson is here. Because it, yeah, it goes back to my Britney thing. If you don't have a man, you become crazy cat bitch. That is what happens. I'm going to look at me like, you know who crazy cat bitch is, right? Yeah, and if you don't get that man, that's where you're going to end up. You will not be a part of the ruling elite of society. You will be crazy cat bitch woman living in a pumpkin. That's what's going to happen to you. It's beautiful in its simplicity. It's beautiful in its aim. It's beautiful in its legitimization of the ideas of a patriarchal class in society. How many female executives of Disney in its history? Uh, big fat zero. Oh, we're shocked. We're shocked by that, right? So, Disney films, at an incredibly young age, work to legitimise the ideologies of a ruling class in Western society. Those ideologies we have articulated. You might think, oh, that's awful. Yeah, it really fucking is. But, that is what the work being done here is. So, when we're doing ideological critique, as we've just done, think about the central message that's being conveyed. Think about who puts that message across. Look for repetitions. What things always are repeated? What images are always repeated? If you're thinking about Disney as a company, you always look for the things they consistently do. Because you can pick out films and examples and say, right, oh, okay, so there's a change. But there's always repetitions of motifs in those films, even if they have changes in them. Think about what is being left out or ignored or not being said. I've never seen a Disney film where the girl wakes up, you know, in a little fucking forest place that she's living in and thinks, do you know, one day I want to be a structural engineer. <laughs> it's Bank of Ackland, but it ain't speaking about that film. Think about the use of exceptions and how they reinforce the ideology itself. Always. This is how we do ideology, people. Now, we've got 20 minutes, so I'm going to take you through an example of exactly how political economy works. I'm going to use an example from the history of British newspapers. So, we're going to talk about my favourite cultural <coughs> car, uh, train wreck, uh, the Daily Mail. But we're going to talk about the Daily Mail from 100 years ago. Uh, it's far too depressing to talk about the Daily Mail today. Um, Boomer ran where, like, you know, on any given day there's going to be snow again, or there's going to be 10 million immigrants who are going to come and kill us all, or Princess Diana is still dead. That's basically their three of headlines, um, right? Instead, we're going to look at the Daily Mail as it is a years ago. Put an awful skip on this because I am terrible at keeping time. So. This is Alfred Harmsworth. Alfred Harmsworth lived from 1865 to 1922. He was the publisher of the Daily Mail. And he basically invented the political economy of the media as it exists today. That idea that I gave you about surplus labor, how we are made into a commodity to be sold, Harmsworth kind of invented that system. So he's an extremely important person in terms of media and media economics. He's also a horrendous human being, like one of the worst that there possibly is, and his kids were even <coughs> worse. So, <coughs> Harmsworth was the owner of the Daily Mail at a time when we see the mass media starting <coughs> to become incredibly important in British society, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. He owned the Daily Mail, and by 1900, he was selling nearly a million copies a day. After that, very shortly after that, 1902, he was selling over a million copies. 
As a rule, at that time, for every copy that was sold, around about five to six people would have read it. You can imagine you buy one newspaper for the household, for example. You might maybe buy one newspaper for like five or six people who would have been part of it. So probably about five to six million people a day were reading his newspaper. His success led to him creating the Daily Express and the Daily Mirror. Two more newspapers which also went high circulation. This is where people think, oh my God, the Daily Mail and the Daily Mirror were made by the same guy. Yes, they were. <coughs> the Daily Express, too. This guy owned all of these newspapers. Uh, he sold newspapers off as well as it suited him. Perhaps he made a lot of money from doing that. Now, the Daily Mail in itself became very known for his crusading journalism and political opinions. The Daily Mirror, interestingly, was aimed primarily at women. The Daily Mail was for men, that had the politics in it, that had the analysis. The Daily Mirror largely had photos, because it was aimed at women. Harmsworth, horrendous misogynist, didn't think women were capable of having such ideas. Patriarchy much. So, the mirror, for which you can see successful emphasis on photography, and easily absorbed by anyone. We see the roots of tabloid journalism in what Harmsworth did with Daily Mirror. Don't tell them too much, keep it nice and simple. This is a newspaper for the thickers. And Harmsworth thought the thick people were basically women. Hmm. Not great. But then, that's probably the least of his crimes. He basically dominated the newspaper industry in the UK through the period up to the end of the First World War. By 1918, the total circulation of uh, his newspapers was around 3.1 million per day. Again, that rule of like buy one newspaper, four or five people actually read it. So that 3.1 million, you can multiply that. <coughs> incredibly important source of information on a daily basis for the vast number of people in our society. And what Harmsworth did importantly was he drove developments in the newspaper industry. Improvements in the presses, faster driving, rail and van distribution systems. So actually these were national newspapers. Prior to the start of the 20th century, having a national newspaper was almost impossible. So you printed it in London, you weren't going to get it to Manchester in time. Because it was a long way. You couldn't get it to Newcastle, you couldn't get it to Glasgow, you couldn't get it to Cardiff or Swansea. It was a London paper. Cardiff had his own paper, Swansea had its own paper. Yeah, because we didn't travel that way. But Improvements in technology in the early part of the 20th century, including the use of telegraphs in order to convey information from across the country instantly, and rail and uh, road links meant that you could actually have national newspapers. Harmsworth looked at major events as being important. One of Harmsworth's key bits of coverage was the Boer War of 1899 to 1902. What Harmsworth leveraged was the newly formed um, telegraph network, which could relay information almost instantaneously, it's not quite, it took a few hours, the information would come from South Africa back to London, so they could have daily reports from the war itself. People lapped this shit up. Previously it would take weeks to find out what was happening in the war in another country. Now you will find out the day or the next day what was happening in the major battles, how people were getting on in the war, who would die, and this sort of thing. So he was acutely aware that people wanted big news stories like this. The Daily Mail used popular human interest content and short, digestible, interesting news items. Sensation and emotion was important. Didn't have to be neutral, didn't have to be the news, you had to give a position, an ideological position. Pioneered tabloid journalism in that way. Aimed it at specific classes in society, made it bright and entertaining, Appeal to the masses. In 1904, Armsworth became Lord Northcliffe. His name is still used. Northcliffe Newspapers is still a major group. It should now be taken over by the Reach Group, but it is still part of that group. 
became the first press baron. Daily Mail, Daily Mirror, Sunday Dispatch, The Evening News. He bought The Observer, and he bought The Times, and he bought The Sunday Times, and he owned all of these newspapers. So, from a Marxist perspective, ownership of the means of production. This guy owned vast amounts of the means of production for media content in the United Kingdom at that time. Newspapers were an essential part of the media at this point. The radio didn't exist. Radio wouldn't exist until the 1920s. Television didn't exist. Television didn't exist until the 1930s and wouldn't be taken up whole scale in the United Kingdom until the 1950s because of the Second World War. So newspapers were the thing. That was it. There was no other broadcast medium. Newspapers were the only one at this position. And he dominated the newspaper industry. He changed the economics of newspaper publishing itself. And that impact was felt throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century. Because of his technological improvements, newspapers now became too expensive to actually produce. If you sold them for half a penny, well, it was actually costing you a penny to produce each one. So you were selling things at a loss. Newspapers couldn't rely on reader income for profitability. Now, Northcliffe <coughs> knew about this. And he didn't have a problem with it, because he had an answer to it, and he saw it as an advantage. The higher he pushed the costs of production up, the more of his competitors would go bankrupt. So he could dominate even more. It's like the monopoly argument, right? He saw the whole thing as, I've got to put everyone else out of business, then I've got more power. So he actually pushed up the quality and cost, because he knew he could cover it in other ways. But he couldn't rely on reader income to cover the costs anymore. So, how did he do it? What did Northcliffe do? Advertising. Advertising. Northcliffe went to companies who were selling goods and said, these are my circulation figures. I will give you 18 million eyes a day on your product if you pay me this. So he took his circulation figures of 3.1 million, extrapolated them to how many people were actually reading the newspapers and said, I you, know, you want to sell your fancy new bit of technology? Your vacuum cleaner? Wow! Here's 18 million people who will be reading this newspaper. Or one of my newspapers. Put your advert in here. Pay me this amount of money. And you've got access to all those people. He went from being in a position where he was losing money to making more money than you can ever imagine. The man became super rich. His model, sell at below cost and use human interest stories to put in <coughs> circulation, then sell the readership to advertisers with visible audited circulation figures and ad costs based on per 1,000 readers. He charged advertisers per 1,000 readers. So if you've got a newspaper with 1.2 million circulation, he was charging them on the basis of each 1,000 people created more advertising space, less news, more space for adverts. It shifted the entire industry to a reliance on advertising income. He didn't produce papers, what he produced was readers. The papers are relevant at this point. What he produced was a circulation figure to be sold. And over time, because of this, advertisers would actually gain control over what the content was going to be with their ideological aims. You know, we want, you know, if you're selling some fucking kitchen or something, right, you don't want it next to a story about how you know, kids these days are smoking blue or something. You want a nice story next to it about how problems are so tasteful these days. <laughs> so it fits nicely with us. The content of newspapers actually changes. What we think of as news actually changes to fit in with the needs and demands of these people. So, we have the classic elements here of the Marxist critique. One person owns the means of production, produces something using surplus value, us, and uses this actually to drive a particular position. Polarizing the industry, tabloid-style human interest papers became popular. The 
quality newspapers, what we call, what we still call things like the Times, the Guardian, they became less important in terms of readers. The result of all this was what we call a concentration of ownership. So ownership gets squeezed down. Individual papers which were owned by individuals all of a sudden can't make any money because the costs have gone so high to actually produce newspapers, you can't do it. Advertisers don't go to smaller newspapers. They want the biggest number of people possible. They don't want your newspaper with 5,000 circulation. They want a newspaper with 1.1 million circulation instead. So they stop funding your newspaper. You close down. It gets picked up by pennies by Northcliffe. He owns more newspapers and more newspapers. It becomes a juggernaut of ownership. So we lose any diversity in the press. By 1914, he owned 40% of morning newspapers, national ones. 45% of the evening newspapers, 15% of the Sunday press. He died in 22, and his brother took over the business at that point. And it's been passed down generations of that family ever since. None of them live in Britain anymore, none of them made tax in this country and haven't done for decades. But they still own the newspaper. Okay. More and more concentration. With concentration of ownership comes power. Who is next to Harmsworth in that image? Tell me, you key historians. Churchill. Winston Churchill. Why would Winston Churchill meet <coughs> with a newspaper owner? What benefit would it be for Winston Churchill to meet with a newspaper owner? Two things really, maybe something to do with the war effort or something to do with the winning an election. Yeah, don't worry too much about the war effort, it's about the winning the elections bit. Primarily, Churchill now is historically thought of as this massive war hero, right? Which is really controversial when you look into Churchill as an individual. But one thing you can also say about Churchill, which isn't controversial, is that he was a politician. He was a politician actually for a number of parties over the history of his period of life. He was involved, he was belonged to three different parties, but most recognised the Conservative Party. Churchill and other Conservative politicians would meet with these press baron families in order to convince them to support their political party. Because they knew if you could get them on board, you have millions of potential voters reading about how great this political party is. So these newspaper owners don't just become rich through advertising, they become powerful because of the power they wield in society to dictate to their readers who they should be voting for in elections. And so it is today. The same system exists. We are in the age of the press barons, wealthy, ennobled individuals that own groups of newspapers. These are interventionists. They impose their own views and character on their newspapers. They don't just stand back and let the editors do it. They want their views done it. The ideology of a dominant class in society, those who own the means of production, is legitimized through the discourses in the media that they own. Press barons would look at what's in their papers and say, no, change it to this. This is what I believe in, and that's what I want those people who are reading my newspaper to believe in. They claim to speak to the people, or for the people, and in fact they speak for themselves. And became very, very criticised <coughs> for their public influence. Just like today. These things never change. I'm going to skip to this one, because we haven't got much time left. This is the Zinoviev letter. In uh, 1924, the first Labour government in the United Kingdom was coming to the end of its reign of power, and there was going to be a general election. And in the week of the general election, the Daily Mail published a letter called the Zinoviev letter claiming to be from a Soviet politician and promoting revolution in England. What the letter said was that the Labour Party was planning on having a revolution in Britain, much like the one that occurred in 1917 in Russia, where the royal family of Russia was executed, 
the Bolsheviks took power and imposed the communist regime on Russia as a state. The Zinoviev letter detailed how that would happen if Labour won the general election that was forthcoming in just four days' time. And the Daily Mail puts this on the front page of its newspaper. So, four days with the letter, Civil War Plot by Socialists <coughs> is the headline that goes up on the front page of the Daily Mail. This is a huge embarrassment to the Labour Party. The Conservatives won an election which they weren't expecting to win and nobody expected them to win, but they won in 1924. Largely on the basis of the political furore that this letter actually created. The letter was a forgery. Zinoviev never existed. It was made up. The letter was sent to the body that would one day become MI6, so part of the state apparatus in the UK, leaked to the Conservative Party, who then leaked it to the Daily Mail. The uh, SIS knew it was a fake, the Conservative Party also knew it was a fake, and the Daily Mail also knew it was a fake, but they didn't care because this was the ammunition they needed to actually close off the deal and make sure that the Labour Party did not win that election. So basically, you have a foreign officer and conservative party <coughs> collaborating in insurance publication in the sympathetic press in order to reach a political outcome. The power that those newspapers had meant that the result could be achieved by doing this. When we think about fake news, you don't think it's like something new. Oh no, it's been going on a long, long time. This is nearly 100 years ago. Um, that tells you a little bit about how power works and ideology works. Uh, it's worth noting that also in the 1930s uh, those newspapers proposed to be sympathetic to the Nazis. You don't see that much anymore in the front cover of the Daily Mail where you know they say oh yeah you know in the 30s we were Nazis but now we don't believe in that because they kind of still do. But yeah this were um, basically most of the black most of the press barons were very sympathetic towards Hitler and thought he had a load of good ideas. Yeah really was that what should be happening in Britain too. If you look at any press coverage in the 1930s, if you look at historical newspapers, they haven't really been censored over time, but you can find this stuff as well. Indeed, here's the owner of the Daily Mail in the 1930s, Lord Rockmere, going to meet Hitler to congratulate him for the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1938. Um, and hurrah for the black shirts, you know, the black shirts, the sort of British Union of fascist people that's a genuine Daily Mail headline from the 1930s as well. Attempting to exercise ideological power in order to convince people that this was good. So this is an example of how ownership at the base creates the content of the superstructure and legitimizes the ideas of those who actually own the means of production of the media. What I want you to do going forward is look very critically at ownership, but also look, what we'll do next week is look at how this changes in the post-digital, in the post-broadcast age. But it is important to know, the mass media still does exist and it has massive amounts of power and we do need to consider that. But we will look more at this next week. See you then.